Okay. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. This is Jacob Prash. Me Yaakov Prash. I'm Akdul Khan, the Yerushalayim, the Harzayatim. We're in Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives. I just want to point out a few features before we commence. Well, I'm pointing here. This area today called Silwan, Silwan, Arab village. The original city of David that David took from the Jebusites, the very foot of it would have been, or is excavated now, the Pool of Siloam, proceeding upward, that is the Temple Mount beginning. Those stairs, if you can see them, are actual stairs going through the Huthi Gate that existed in the time of Jesus. Jesus and the Apostles would have actually walked on those stairs to where that gate was. The mosque you see with the black dome is the Mosque of Aqsa, where King Abdullah, the great-grandfather of the present king of Jordan, King Abdullah II, King Abdullah I was assassinated by the Islamic Muftis man because he wanted to make peace with the Jews. This plaza closer to us on the east side is the area where Solomon's portico would have been where the early church yes, met. Yes, yes. And approximately at that very point in the corner is where the Apostle James would have been martyred, thrown off according to the historical record. He would have been thrown off there and killed. Going now this way, we see the Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock, also known as the Mosque of Omar, where it's inscribed in Arabic that God has no son, and just to the north of that, you'll see a little dome. Between the arches and the Dome of the Rock, you'll see a little dome. That is called the Dome of the Spirits. It is believed by many archaeologists that that was the approximate site of the Holy of Holies. We have a dispute among the archaeologists, some saying that the temple was actually where the Dome of the Rock is, and the others saying it was where the Dome of the Spirits is in alignment with the East Gate, the East Gate, which is now closed in fulfillment of the prophecies of Ezekiel, once the Messiah entered. It will be closed again when the Messiah enters for the millennial reign. The valley below is the Valley of Kidron. Its northern orifice is known as the Valley of Jehoshaphat, Yehoshaphat, Jehovah shall judge. And this area to where I'm pointing here where the golden couplers are, that is the area of Gatshemoni, Gethsemane. We are at Prize Real Estate, but it is from here that the Lord Jesus left, and it is literally to here where he shall return. I'm reading from the Book of Acts, which in Hebrew we call Mahaseh HaShlichim, Book of Acts Chapter 1. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven and after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, okay. which he said, you heard of from me. For John the Baptist baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons or the epics which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. 
And after he said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood next to them. And they also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, this Yeshua, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come just in the same way as you've watched him go to heaven. And when they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away, observant Jews could not walk beyond a limited distance on a Saturday. So a Sabbath day's journey would have been from the Mount of Olives to the city of David, a short distance, something you could do within Jewish law, according to the Torah, or the interpretation of the Torah, on a Saturday in the Mount of Olives. We then read the same from the book of Zechariah chapter 14. I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, the houses plundered, and women ravished, and half the city exiled. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. And that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley, so that half of the mountain will move towards the north and the other half towards the south. There is a fissure separating the northernmost peak of the Mount of Olives, today called Mount Scopus, part of Sophim in the times of the Bible, where the Romans had a lookout point during the siege of 70 AD. A fissure runs from it, separating the Mount of Olives to the Temple Mount. The last major earthquake was in 1927. It is entirely plausible, as the seismologists tell us, that the Mosque of Omar can be destroyed by another such earthquake, as it was very badly damaged in 1927. Nonetheless, the Lord is going to come, and there will be a seismic split of this particular mountain. The triumphal entry would have taken place to the East Gate. An evangelical Christian archaeologist, Dr. James Fleming, found Herodian stones under the East Gate, so we know that is the location of the triumphal entry, the Hallel Rabbah, when Psalm 113 to 118 was sung to Jesus, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. It will take place here. Now, Islam will always have its own counterfeit, its own tradition. Islam teaches there'll be a tightrope across the Kidron, and everyone will walk across it after Jesus raises Mohammed from the dead. They actually teach that. The good people will make it all the way across by the tightrope, and the bad ones will fall off. This story seems to have a parody in Friedrich Nietzsche's also Sprach Zarathustra. Nonetheless, you always find some kind of demonic or satanic counterfeit to what's happening here. The dispute over this land today between Islam and Judaism is not a dispute simply between two sons, two brothers. It is that, but it's more. It's a conflict between Satan and the purposes of God. This is not to say that Israel is a righteous nation. It is not. It is an unbelief. But God will deal with them. The prophecy of Zechariah 14 concerning the Mount of Olives speaks of Jesus coming back the way he left and setting his feet on it. Jesus explains Zechariah 14 in Acts chapter 1. Thus it is not primarily talking about the events in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed as Jesus and Daniel predicted. It's something of the future. Right where we are standing, things are very tense to this moment between Jew and Arab. Tourists get caught in the middle of it. You can feel an actual pressure that is not simply emotional, but there's a spiritual battle for this turf. I'm not hyper-charismatic by any means, but I know that there are 
battles in the heavenlies over this turf where we are standing, and they will climax with the return of Jesus. Now Jesus told us two things. The first thing he told us was, it's not for you to know the times or seasons the Father has fixed by his own authority. When asked that at this time he's going to restore the kingdom. Notice that Jesus said, God will restore the kingdom. It's going to happen. He implicitly said it's going to happen. In Luke 21, 24, he explicitly said it's going to happen. The Jews will be back in the city. Jesus said it both explicitly and implicitly. But he says it is not the purpose of the church to worry about political Zionism, except as a sign to be recognized for his return. The Lord will fight for Zion. This does not mean Christians should not support Israel or recognize what it means prophetically. They certainly should. However, there are organizations that do not read what Jesus said. Instead of focusing on the Zionism and the prophecies of the national restoration of the Jews to their capital, Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses, beginning in Jerusalem, then Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We are to focus on preaching the gospel. There are those who focus on what Jesus said not to focus on, at the expense of not focusing on what he did. Well, I appreciate John Hagee's support for Israel. His views that Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah, the dual covenant theology, or that there's some salvation for the Jews outside of Christ because of the law, is frankly heretical. Organizations like the International Christian Embassy are basically oxymorons. Paul says that the real embassies and ambassadors of Jesus are those who preach it. The Christian Embassy has a non-evangelistic policy, totally focused on political Zionism. Bridges for peace is another. No Christ, no peace. The only way to have peace between Jew and Arab is the gospel of Jesus. Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua HaMashiach. It is the only way. One problem we have is so many Christians forget the final words of Jesus. This was the title of my first book, The Final Words of Jesus, still available at Oriel, on Kendall, YouTube. Um, still available through Moriel, through Kendall, etc. Nonetheless, one square mile, the biggest man-made plateau in the world, taking a relatively small mountain and expanding it. That one square mile on back of us is the most disputed piece of real estate in the world. Whether it's to here where we are standing, that Jesus will return. We know that Jesus stayed at Bethany, where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived, which is on the ridge on the other side of the Mount of Olives, on the east side, facing towards what is today the Jewish expanded community of Male Adumim. Nonetheless, it's here. It's all here. We know where these things are, we know what happened here, and we know what is going to happen here. It is from this perspective and this very important perspective on the future concerning end time prophecy that we begin this week in prophecy. Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here live in Jerusalem via Skype with James Jacob Prash, and this is This Week in Prophecy. Well, let's look at the events of this week from the perspective of where I'm situated in Jerusalem. Much fanfare is being made as we speak in the United States and in the international media concerning what anyone would describe practically as Donald Trump's malperformance in the press conference held with Vladimir Putin in Helsinki. It was indeed something of an embarrassing presentation by the president, but of course the left-wing media is attempting to, to exploit it to make it appear that he has done things that he's not done, including pandering to Mr. Putin. In fact, before he arrived in Helsinki, one of his concluding acts in his meetings with 
and the American and NATO leaders was to protest the German pipeline under the Baltic, making it possible to have direct sale of natural gas from Russia to Germany while bypassing Poland, Hungary, and the Ukraine and other countries. This goes back to the Schroeder regime in Germany, where Mr. Putin invested 11 billion in outlays for the planned project and put Mr. Schroeder on top of it and what amounts to basically a political payoff in the view of many people in the media. Donald Trump protested this. Donald Trump increased military aid to the Ukraine. Donald Trump has not lifted any of the American sanctions on Russia. Yet his malperformance has given the left-wing media the ground it needs to say that he is pandering. In Israel, however, there's a different perspective. It is being suggested in the Israeli media that this was designed intentionally to divert attention from what actually took place in the meetings that took place between Mr. Netanyahu and Mr. Putin just prior to the Helsinki summit and Mr. Trump's meeting with Mr. Putin. That there was a compromise on Syria in order to prevent military conflict between Israel and the United States and Russia together with Syria and Iran. They were trying to defuse a very dangerous situation. Let's begin looking at this. Here in Israel, as I speak, there are national military drills taking place. Israel is, in effect, holding war games in preparation for the possibility of a war on multiple fronts. One in the north with Lebanon and Syria, that is with Syria and Hezbollah in Lebanon, and the other with Hamas on the Gaza Strip, should there be a coordinated attack on Israel. You see tanks, military vehicles move nationally, and you see an increase in fighter aircraft activity taking place over more than Galilee and near the Gaza Strip. Something is obviously happening as these war games continue. Meanwhile, not only the Israeli Air Force, but the United States Air Force and the U.S. Navy, with F-18s flying from the deck of the USS Harry Truman off the coast of Galilee and Lebanon, <coughs> Syria, are flying around the clock reconnaissance missions over the disputed areas of Ba'ara and Klinitra, in the same area where the Russian Air Force is operating in support of the Assad Syrian forces. So you have Israeli and American together with Russian Air Forces flying in the same airspace. These are armed airplanes that can engage in combat with each other <clears throat> in the event the radar becomes locked. That would be a signal that you're being targeted. This is a very, very intense situation as it could lead to aerial warfare between the Israelis and Americans against the Russians acting in support of Assad. The meetings with Putin that were held by Mr. Netanyahu and Mr. Trump are there to defuse the possibility of this happening. A compromise has been made. And the compromise is a controversial one. The Israelis and Americans have agreed to a tentative handing over of the border areas of Israel that is not only the Dara region near Jordan, but the Kunitra region near Israel into the hands of Russia and Russian surrogate Syrian forces. However, the Assad forces are still Syrian and are composed of members of Hezbollah and the Iranian Revolutionary Guards in Syrian uniforms. This is quite a mess and making of quite a shootout. Now, this continues to happen at the same time as nine new fires have been extinguished, some of them major, from incendiary balloons launched by, <coughs> launched by Hamas from Gaza. In addition to these nine fires, an incendiary device landed in the playground of a children's kindergarten while the children were playing there. Again, this was not reported by the international media outside of Israel but it has infuriated the citizens of the village of Asterot, 
near Ashkelon, and we have seen a deployment of a second Iron Dome force outside of Tel Aviv. With the Hof Ashkelon Iron Dome fully active, intercepting projectiles and missiles from Gaza, as well as using drones in an attempt to down these balloons, a second Iron Dome force has been deployed to defend the southern flank of the city of Tel Aviv itself. This represents a major step up in Israeli defense preparation. It shows that the Israelis are quite serious about making a move into Gaza. Mr. Netanyahu is being pressured to do something about these balloons and the infuriation of people that these balloons have landed in a kindergarten playground has brought about even protests when Mr. Netanyahu visited Sderot two days ago, this week in prophecy. Watch Gaza, but also watch what is taking place in the north. What are we speaking about? The Israelis have been preparing for a series of possible scenarios. One is a new deal being made in the Kunicha reason, similar to the deal that the Russians and Syrians made with the rebel forces in the Da'ara region. This would put hostile forces right up to the fence of the Golan Heights. The second is a siege of Kinitra by Russian Air Force-backed Syrian and Hezbollah Iranian forces. The third is the one the Americans are warning about. That would be a southern assault from the Da'ara region by Syria and Hezbollah, again with Russian backing from the Nawa area of the, of, of, of the town of Nawa near Da'ara up to Kunitra. The U.S. Central Command thought this was the most likely possibility if there is going to be a further deployment of Syrian troops with Iranian partners along the Golan Heights. Again, this is a strategically very, very serious situa situation. They have taken a pocket held by Khalid bin Walad's army near Kunitra, and this would place them near the Israeli town of Hamat Gader, where I've been many times, and very close to the Sea of Galilee. Now, if you have Syrians there, well, there's always been Syrians there. But now you have Syrians there operating under the air cover of the Russian Air Force with Hezbollah and Iranian troops wearing Syrian uniforms, getting their orders from Tehran. This is another kind of situation entirely. And it accounts for the meetings that Mr. Netanyahu and Mr. Trump have had with Vladimir Putin. Russia and Syria may actually bomb Kunitra. The question is, what would the Israeli response be? At the same time, Iran and Russia this week in prophecy have begun to demand that the United Nations peacekeeping force called the UNDOF monitoring the buffer zone between Syria and Israel in the Kadisha region be downplayed, be played back, be reduced from its operating capacity. Now this would bring no buffer into play where you would have Iranians and Syrians in direct confrontation with the Israelis with no UN peacekeeping force or monitoring force in the middle. Mr. Putin has been pushing this. At the same time, there are Syrian refugees from anti-Assad contingents who are only 1,200 meters from the Israeli military deployment at uh, Tel Fara. This is a position quite close to Israel and the Israeli Bashan division, which is always deployed for both defensive and offensive action on the Golan Heights, are on maximum alert 
Again, this is not being broadcast outside of Israel. What was happening in Helsinki was an act to defuse a possible military conflict between Israel, Syria, Russia that could involve the United States. Meanwhile, Russia has resumed intense airstrikes on the Da'ara region, which again is in southern Syria, bordering Jordan, but not far from Israel. Mr. Putin is a man who obviously cannot be trusted. He's a man who's angered that the Americans have killed hundreds of Russians. He's a man who is not happy that the price of oil is going down again, which is affecting Russia economically. And Mr. Putin has stated that it is unthinkable for Iran to remove its troops from Iraq and Syria back to Iran. Iran has invested $30 billion in Syria on the side of the Assad forces. What is happening in the American strategy is bringing economic pressure on Iran itself. So it is economically squeezed and pressed in its ability to be able to afford the continuing Iranian action in Syria. In other words, choke off their economic means to continue their military presence. This has been the American strategy, and it may be working. Nonetheless, Russia and Iran have issued a bid to curtail the UN peacekeeping and monitoring forces in the buffer between Syria and Israel that has existed since 1974 in the aftermath of the Yom Kippur War. This is taking place this week in prophecy. You have these Iranian troops and Hezbollah troops, including Revolutionary Guards, in Syrian uniforms, quite close to Israeli positions, being backed by the Russian Air Force. At the same time, the Israelis and Americans are taking aerial countermeasures. This week in prophecy, in order to prevent further entrenchment by the Iranians, for the third week, the Israeli Air Force has hit the T-4 air base at Tayas in southern Syria. Again, we do not know for sure if there were any Russians killed, but there certainly would have been Russian military and technical advisors at that base that the Israelis have attacked this week. Um, we also know that there are two Iranian militias being deployed very close to the Kanitra region, the Liwa al-Zufakar uh, and the Abu al-Fadl al-Abu Brigade. Both of these brigades are being deployed quite close to Kanitra. Again, you're talking about eyesight distance from the Israeli border, from the Israeli fence. Their commander, Haddar al-Juburi, uh, who's the commander of the Zufigar Brigade, was photographed in the Assyrian 4th Division headquarters in the area of Tarfas. Very serious situation. Iranians, Hezbollah, and Syrians fighting as one force with Russian advisors and Russian Air Force providing aerial cover and backing against the rebels very close to Israel and prepared to move into Kanitra. This is not good. It provides the real background of what was happening in the Helsinki summit. But the media was talking about Mr. Trump and Mr. Trump, understandable desire to discredit the politically motivated witch hunt of the Mueller investigations. <coughs> but all of this diverted attention away from what was really taking place, an effort, an effort to prevent armed conflict between the United States and Russia. Remember, armed conflict has already taken place between the United States and Russian mercenaries five weeks ago, where between two and three Russians were killed by two and three hundred Russians were killed by the Americans, in addition to a number of Iranians and Syrians near the Euphrates River. Mr. Putin is very aware 
the Americans are quite capable of doing it again, should they have to, and are quite capable of engaging the Russian Air Force, as are the Israelis. Nobody wants to see this happening. Now, there is a third component of a Gog and Magog scenario that is at present missing. That is Turkey. Turkey has not been a player in these events, has economic problems of its own, even in the aftermath of the election victory of the Erdogan regime. Turkey is also speaking about buying an air defense system of American Patriot missiles that was announced this week in prophecy. But what you essentially see happening is the United States and Israel have agreed in Helsinki and in Moscow to the following. A Russian-controlled area of Kunitra and Da'ara of approximately 30 miles, 40 kilometers, where the Russians will guarantee there will not be a deployment of Iranian or Syrian forces threatening Israel beyond that point. There may be Syrian forces, but no Iranians, and the Syrians would not propose a threat to Israel if Mr. Putin is to be believed. The Americans and Israelis have sacrificed their support for anti-Assad forces in exchange for this and have basically made a concession. They want that 30-mile, 40-kilometer, approximately, buffer in the Kunitra region where there will be no Iranians, a certain amount of Syrians that will not propose a strategic threat to Israel. But let's understand the full picture. Iran is largely controlling Hamas, at least to an appreciable degree. The Israelis have responded this week by closing the last border crossing, Kerem Shalom, into Gaza to everything except food and medical supplies. The Israelis have also, this week in prophecy, limited the fishing area of Gaza from six miles down to three in response to these balloons. The Egyptians are also stepping up their control of the border between the Sinai and Gaza. There has been a response, but a bigger response may be coming. There were two major Israeli air strikes this week against Hamas targets in Gaza, but Hamas is being animated, at least to an appreciable degree, by Iran from the Gaza Strip. Secondly, you have the presence of Hezbollah, who made major gains in the recent elections in Lebanon, as well as the fact that pro-Iranian Shias made major gains in the elections in Iraq. And then, of course, we have the presence of Iranians and Hezbollah in Syrian uniforms as a contingent of Assad's forces along the Golan Heights and in the Ara along the northwest border of Jordan. Iran, in other words, is attempting to surround Israel, being able to attack from the north, from the north east, and from the south. It is Iran's hand and it is Iran that Israel is most concerned with, and it is Iran that the Pentagon is most concerned with. Iran, however, can only act to a certain point because of Israeli air power and because of its own economic problems. Additionally, it has technological limits that can only be augmented with Russian assistance given not directly to Iran, but to Iran via the Syrians who Iran is backing. This is the reality. The scenario is therefore one where Iran is trying to turn Gaza into another Lebanon and to turn the Kenitra border region adjacent to Golan Heights in Syria into another Lebanon. So you have an Iranian-controlled 
Gaza on the southwest, an Iranian-controlled Kunitra region of the Syrian border next to the Golan Heights on the northeast, and an Iranian-controlled southern Lebanon on the north bordering with Galilee. This is the situation. Again, Mr. Putin is not to be trusted. If or not these reports in the Israeli media are true, that Mr. Trump's botched up press conference was deliberate as a diversion to draw international media attention away from what was really happening in the three-way parlance between Mr. Netanyahu, Mr. Putin, and Donald Trump is questionable. There is evidence for it. There is probably a degree of truth in it. But what we see happening is a desperate quest by all involved to prevent an open shootout between Israel and Syria in which the United States and Russia would become involved. How long or how well such an arrangement will survive, we will see. But as it is, Mr. Netanyahu and Mr. Trump have brokered a deal with Mr. Putin, who has agreed to control Iranian presence and Syrian actions for a distance of about 30, kilo, uh, 30 miles, 40 kilometers from the Golan border. But the Da'ala region has largely been given over. Even today, there are more Russian airstrikes taking place. If Mr. Putin does not keep his word, there does not seem to be any other possibility other than a massive Israeli counterattack along the Golan Heights, especially if Russia and Iran have their way and the United Nations monitoring force is removed from that buffer that has existed since 1974. Many of these things, in fact, probably the majority of it, is not being adequately covered, or in some instances, not covered at all in the international media. But it's certainly what is taking place in Israel this week in prophecy. Please continue to pray for Mr. Netanyahu and his government, for Mr. Trump and his administration. We cannot trust Vladimir Putin. We can certainly not trust any Islamic radicals, be it the Alawite regime of Mr. Assad in Syria or the Iranians. But we do know, Hine lo yunum velo yishan shomer Israel. He who keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. My name is James Jacob Pratch from Moriel Ministries. Remember, all of these signs point to Jesus is coming again. Let us tell the unsaved about him and his salvation, the soon coming king, while there is still time to do so. Tell people about Jesus and pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Shalom, shalom, Yerushalayim. They shall prosper who love thee. God bless and thank you for listening. Thank you, Jacob.